But you can't lose if you don't play. I always heard it that you can't win if you don't play. The department puts you in a case it doesn't want. You're giving people that are useless or untrustworthy. Correct. If you push too hard and any shit hits the fan, you'll be blamed for it. Correct. If you don't push hard enough and there's no arrest, you'll be blamed for that too. Correct. The game is rigged, but you cannot lose if you do not play. I'm Eddie Conway, host of Rattling the Bars for the Real News Network. This month we're doing a segment to honor Black History Month. This week we have with us Maria Broom, who's a dancer, a storyteller, an actor, an actress, and a teacher, with us to discuss her career. Maria, thanks for joining me. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, I'm curious about the arts. You've been in the arts since you were six years old. You've been in the city for a long time. What's the situation with the arts? The school system it don't seem to be financing it. Uh, it doesn't seem to be flourishing in the city. Uh, what's your take on it? Uh, what's happening and what should happen to make it better? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Starting with the schools, because you're bringing the children up, you're growing a generation up through the schools. Some of the arts are slipping back into the schools now, but for a minute, they took all of the arts away. Um, I think of it in terms of like a cart with four wheels. Education that included the academics, included physical uh, education, and included the arts, which was music, which was dance, which was singing and choir and glee club. They had all that stuff. They had extracurricular activities. And you had it in school, too. Children learned to draw. And then, for some reason, a decision was made to take the arts out of the schools, which left the cart lopsided, trying to move forward on just three wheels. And when you do that, you, um, you stop feeding the whole child. You stop feeding the whole person that you are teaching because the arts addresses a part of your being that isn't addressed by just academics. We see, and there have been studies now about why the arts should be back in the schools, you know, because you're seeing how when you focus children and students and young people on the arts, on things that they like, they're much more attentive, they're much more receptive. So we're finding how much the arts are a useful tool. They really are a useful tool. Now, as far as the funding of the arts in cities and around the country and whatnot, yeah, there's been cutbacks um, for big funding, for big artistic ventures. But since that's been happening over the years, what I've been seeing is this slow influx of so many artistic groups, so many artistic places, so many places where people can go and do their arts, so many new little theaters, theater companies, um, people writing plays and producing it themselves, finding a church, finding a building, finding a space, performing it. So much dancing, so much dancing now. It's unbelievable. The thing though, Eddie, is that it's not always on the radar. It's not on the big screen because the money for promotion, the money for PR is not there. And that's what takes so much money. A lot of PR, a lot of promotion, that kind of money isn't there, so the money that is possibly there really goes into the art itself. But then you have people like the Deutsch Foundation who provide the city with places like the Motor House, like Open Works, and these other places that they're building. And there are other organizations and people who are providing that. You have Impact Hub, even the Parkway Theater. You're just seeing a lot more coming back into the city but in small batches, in small pockets. And it's fantastic, really. Like, it's, like I said, you're not gonna see big PR, you're not gonna see big commercials like you do for Broadway shows or for the Hippodrome or for the Lyric, but it's there, it's there, and people are getting it out, word of mouth. 
social media, people are coming, they're attending, audiences are maybe 90 at a time as opposed to 900 at a time, but it's happening. And then places like Center Stage and now The Lyric are stretching out more and more to the community. And they're taking arts into the schools and they're letting the students come and perform in their buildings. They're letting them study in their buildings. It's happening, but you have to kind of keep your eye out for it. I guess because I'm in it, I see a lot of it, but it's not advertised and promoted much right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's take a step back in history for a minute <laughs> and tell me a little bit about your media career here in Baltimore, Miami, <laughs> and maybe some of the people you might have met. <laughs> Whoa. My life has been like a movie in that being at the right place at the right time gave me an opportunity to say, okay, I'll do it. Um, I've always wanted to be a dancer since I was six years old. That's pretty much all I wanted to do. I wanted to dance and or act. So to perform, that's what I wanted to do. So junior high, high school, college, that was my focus and that's what I did. And I had companies. Uh, with choreography and we performed it, whatnot. But then when I was at Morgan, I was asked if I was interested in getting a Fulbright scholarship. And a Fulbright scholarship would actually pay you to go study in another country, the subject of your choice. I applied for India. I wanted to study Indian dance. That whole Eastern vibe appealed to me, had always appealed to me, so I applied for India. I didn't get India, so they offered me a choice between Romania or Germany. And neither one was anything like Indian dance, but it was an opportunity to go study in another country, so I selected uh, Germany. So I went to Germany, I studied there for a year in the Dance Academy in Berlin. So many opportunities came my way because I was there. And I just said, yes, come do this. Okay, yes, come do this. Yes, you know, a chance to perform in hair, a chance to perform in, as a dancer in a performance about Patrice, uh, the Patrice, Patrice Lumumba. Lumumba. Right, they needed an African <coughs> dancer. So a lot of opportunities. Mm -hmm. So when that year was over, I was flying back and I was thinking, okay, what do I want to do next, you know? And I saw these women on the plane and they could speak several languages and they were... They were stewardesses. I said, there you go. Apply to be a stewardess. At least you could travel and do things. I applied to be a stewardess. I got the job with Pan Am. I was working out of Miami, about to fly to Managua, and a cameraman and a reporter came up to me, and they said, we're doing an interview about these x-ray devices. What, can we interview you? They interviewed me. They liked my voice. They took the piece back to the studio, they wanted me to come in for an audition to be a news reporter. I said, I really am not into news that way. I really am a dancer, I really am an actor and whatnot. But they offered me a job, I took it, I said okay. So I wound up being a news reporter for the ABC affiliate in Miami. I did that for about a year, but I said, you gotta get back to dancing, Maria. I came back to Baltimore, <laughs> I went to apply for a couple of jobs in dance. They didn't work out in my favor. I needed a job. So I wound up going to WJZ and they offered me a job. And the next thing I know, they put my face on these billboards, Viva Maria. They gave me a position called the public defender where I could help people get things done that weren't being taken care of. Mm -hmm. And I did that for about four or five years. But then I had to get back to dancing. I had to get back to what I really what, wanted what to is do. This, uh, what station is that? WJZ. Was that Channel 13? At it was the Channel time? 13. It was an ABC affiliate then. I don't know what affiliate it is okay. now. Okay. Okay. Right. But WJZ okay. here in Baltimore. Okay. So that was back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And then um, after four years in that, 1977, I just said, I've got to get back to dance. Mm -hmm. And I did. Mm -hmm. I left television and um, I started a dance studio in the basement of Mondalmin Mall. It was brand new back then. And then I had another studio, and then I had a company called the Dance Bringers of Baltimore, which featured a lot of different women, mm -hmm. mostly women, 
shapes and sizes, and we performed at Artscape and all these things. So, can you briefly just talk a little bit about? I'm not going to mention Oprah. I mean, I know you work with <laughs> Oprah, and uh, oh, for some yeah. sometimes, right? But can you talk about the the dance therapy that you did in hospitals and yeah. prisons? After I did all the dancing and the performing. And then I went to study dance at UCLA for a while. I, dance, I studied dance from different cultures. And then I came back to Baltimore and I really got into what is dance really for? And then I thought about its healing qualities. And so at that time they had just started graduate programs in expressive arts and one of them was dance therapy. So I went to Goucher in the master's program of dance therapy. And I st um, it nourished me to a certain extent, but it didn't feed me to the extent that I needed to. So I left the master's program, but then I was offered a chance to do dance therapy work in these various hospitals and places. And I worked with men who were incarcerated. I worked with children who were too emotionally unbalanced to be in regular schools. I worked with women who were in locked wards using just dance just dance to help heal from the inside, which informed what I do now as one of my things other than just teaching. I offer something called dance medicine, which is trying to get people to dance from the inside. I bring the music, I bring the prompts and the meditation to get people to dance and using dance as a healing tool or survival art, I call it. Mm -hmm. you know, so you've been involved in teaching and you still teach today. School for the Arts, the 24 the years, art. yeah. Uh, how do you see art impacting people's lives? I mean, why do you teach art? And what do you think, it? how does it benefit it's the a survival society? It's, it's, it's what's needed in, for survival. Uh, when you look at indigenous cultures, they didn't set aside something and call it the arts. Dancing, singing, drawing, writing, chanting, drumming. It was what everybody did every day. When you were little, you got to see it, and when you got older, you could do it. When I got to spend time in Sesimarimbe, a village in um, Uganda. Oh, Uganda. You know, this one was Uganda. It's what you did. Mm -hmm. Young people did it. They had their youth and their energy, then the elders did it. The little people are always watching and learning as they grow. People beautify things. It's artistic. They live artistically. We, unfortunately, have taken the arts and made it a separate thing. Then it, when it got to the point where you had to pay to learn it, then you had to pay to watch it, and then you had to be talented to even do it, as opposed to, it's what everybody does. You come out of the womb with rhythm, you sing, you dance, and then when you find out more and more about how to do it, you polish it, you create yourself more and more of it. It's what people do, and it's attends to our spirituality. Our spirituality is very much connected with our artistry, our art artistry. It's, it's the one place, it's the venue where you can express your spirituality. And when you take it away, when you put it in museums, when you put it in, lock it away on stages, and you can only get to it if you have the money to pay for it, you're denying the village what they really need. Blessings for the museums that are now saying, free days, come look at the art, come be inspired. Our art places here in, in Baltimore are remarkable, remarkable. They really are, they're getting that way. And the artistry, look, at we've got Joyce Scott. Joyce Scott from the hood, you know, still lives in the hood from a mother and ancestry that were always, always artists. And now she's doing it now. She's a big Martha fellow. Mm -hmm. Who's Joyce Scott? I don't know. Oh, my yes. good Shame on you, <laughs> Joyce Scott. She's um, one of our most beloved and most provocative an activist artist, mm -hmm. worldwide traveler, 
and all of her art has messages. All of her art has messages, whether it's about racism, whether it's about sexism, whether it's about <clears throat> slavery, mm -hmm. all of it. And it's gotten to be such a big, um, phenomenal gift to so many people. She was recently awarded last year one of the MacArthur Fellows. Mm -hmm. She's incredible, and she's uh, here in Baltimore. Lives right there, mm -hmm. Penn North Station area. Okay, we we'll have to end <laughs> on that note. Thank you for joining Your me. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you for giving me a chance to talk about this. Mm -hmm.